Good morning. Good morning, Mercy Village Church. Uh, we are the people of God and we are late as always, but that's fine. Listen, does everybody remember that time we did start on time? Because it did happen. It ha- one time we started only two minutes late and one time we started exactly on time. So we'll like in the in the just years of Mercy Village Church, we'll look back on those two days like forever, we'll always be like that. Those two days that people were on time were just so, such incredible days. I am going to give us some announcements, and then we are going to actually uh, jump into our service with a with a welcome. Uh, safe space is on the back, so you should have got a half sheet of paper on the way in here. All the announcements on the back. Safe space has been rescheduled. Date TBD. So uh, stay tuned to social media to the app. Those things. There just wasn't enough turnout for this evening, uh, so they're going to reschedule that. So just be aware of that information. Also, there is there are QR codes on the back of that half sheet of paper. One is to get the app if you want to stay up with what's going on. Uh, the other is the uh, is how you can give to uh, Mercy Village Church. Everything is is digital now, so that those are on the back of that um, order of worship as well. So. With that said, our deacon Jeremiah is going to come and, and welcome us this morning. We welcome you today. We are the broken, welcoming the broken, the weary, welcoming the weary, the burdened, welcoming the burdened. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Amen. Will you stand with me? Uh, On the screen you will see a welcome. Oh yeah, we exist to experience and embody redemption and renewal in Christ alone. We thought about that very intentionally when we put that mission statement together. That we would be people who both experience it for ourselves but also embody it towards others. Those two things that we experience have in Jesus alone, and that is redemption and renewal for our souls. The parts that are in bold are for you to say, the parts that are not are for me. So let's say this together before we sing. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in Him. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is very good. We will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in our mouths. Our soul will make its boast only in the Lord. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is very good. He hears our prayers. He delivers us, his children. Those who look to him are radiant and shameless. We are his saints and he is our portion forever. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is very good. The Lord watches over his children and he draws near to the brokenhearted. Afflictions may come, but we are not condemned. He is our refuge forever. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is very good. Jesus saves the crushed in spirit. We have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Oh, taste and see that Jesus is good. Blessed are the ones who take refuge in Him. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is very good. Help. No. Thank you. You guys are better than I am. Father, thank you that you are very, very good. Might you enliven our taste buds today to taste and see that you are, in fact, good to us. Maybe the week's been good for us. Maybe it hasn't. Maybe the morning's been good for us. Maybe it hasn't. But you never cease to be good. Might we experience that together today as the people of God. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Man, our God is so good. He's great. He has done great things today. Sing this with me.
scripture reading comes from Psalm 30, uh, verse 8 through 12. It says, To you, O Lord, I cry, and to the Lord I plead for mercy. What profit is there in my death if I go down to the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it tell of your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my helper. You have turned me, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and clothed me with gladness that my glory may sing your praise and not be silent. O Lord, my God, I will give thanks to you forever. You hear me when I call You are my morning song Though darkness the night it cannot hide the light whom shall I fear you crush the enemy underneath my feet you are my sword and shield though troubles linger still whom shall I Always by my 
by our side. Um, we love you. We give you praise today. In your name we pray, amen. Kids, stay put for just a second. We have something special we want to do as a church, but first a little humor that you're going to need to hear. Uh, if you know Jack, if you remember Jack Handy, anybody from Saturday Night Live? So he would say, uh, the rain made me think of this. It has nothing to do with this church service. <laughs> if a child ever asks you why it's raining, I think a good answer is to say that God is crying. And if as a follow-up question the child asks you, why is God crying, I think a good thing to tell them is, I don't know, but it's probably something you did. (laughs) That's a joke, right? I I don't know that psychologically that's helpful for your children, but uh, anyway. My wife's not here, so normally when she's here, the, the advice is if it pops in your head, you don't have to say it, but since she's... Not here, I'm free to say whatever I want, just kidding. We're going to install a deacon uh, today, our third uh, deacon as a, as a church. I want to quickly just remind us, distinguishing those roles between elder and deacon, because I know we all come from a lot of different backgrounds, even denominations, and so we may uh, have different nuances that we associate with the words deacon and, and elder, and so I just want to distinguish what those are by way of telling you who we are. As a church, we believe Mercy Village Church is congregation-owned, deacon-served, and elder-directed. So that first piece is your piece. Uh, We are um, an elder-directed and elder-led church, but there are decisions that are taken ownership of by the members. You all have a whole host of things that you vote on, about six or eight different specific things that matter to the direction of the church. That's a way of us conveying that reality, that not only do you own the boots-on-the-ground ministry of the church, but you also own uh, the direction of the church at a, at a degree as well. And so uh, for our members, we are, we are owned by our membership. Our deacons are members of the church. Our elders are members of the church. It is a together piece. Within that congregation, within that membership, though, God does call out two people, two specific roles, more than two people, but uh, two specific roles, uh, elder and deacon. Uh, Elder is an office that is for those who will, uh, in particular, what separates an elder oftentimes from deacons and normal congregants, a standard that's held to them, is that they're able to teach. Not everyone else is held to that that same standard. A lot of the other things that an elder is held to, though, 
are basic biblical character traits that all of us should be striving to be uh, held accountable to in our lives. But in particular, an elder is held to that distinction, to be able to teach. That doesn't mean other people can't teach and aren't able to teach, but an elder specifically needs to be. The deacon is not held to that same standard. But there are standards that you can find in uh, 1 Timothy 3, chapters eight through, or verses 8 through 13. Those are the qualifications of a deacon. These are specific things that they are held accountable for. Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6, is the model of a deacon. So the elders were installed to pray for the church, teach the church, and direct the church in the earliest days of the church. And all of a sudden, what the elders found out, what the apostles found out, is there's a lot to do with this growing church. We need help. We need people who are going to serve alongside us for this same mission. And so in Acts chapter 6, you see the installation of the first deacons, those who will come alongside the leaders, the elders, the pastors of the church. We use those words interchangeably here. Pastor and elder mean the same thing. And serve the church with their hands and their feet. I've heard it said that deacons are like shock absorbers for the church. They're the ones who come in with their head on a swivel looking for what needs done and how can I serve. So that is what a deacon does. They're biblically qualified men or women who are shock absorbers for the church. Oftentimes they're installed with a specific goal in mind. And so uh, today we're going to present Brandon Hibner as a deacon. Yeah, you can clap for him. And we're going to give him the hardest role of all. We're going to ask him to do something with you knuckleheads who are getting ready to go from fifth grade into like sixth grade and seventh grade and eighth grade. I know. The fact that he even said yes is a miracle (laughs) to that. We're not going to make any promises about exactly what that's going to look like but because... If you promise people the world and then you deliver a lot, they're still not satisfied. So we're, but this fall, we're going to roll out something. Something for our young people who are moving into the middle school age range. And so there'll be more details about that to come. But uh, instead of the czar of youth ministry, we're just going to call him the, the deacon. Of, uh, but, that's going to be kind of, but, but beyond that, these deacons, you'll often see them serving communion. You'll also see them just serving in random ways within the church. That's the role in the job of a deacon. So Brandon, if you'll come forward and your family can as well, and Pastor Josh. And while they're coming forward, although it's not required that we do this by our bylaws, it should be, we'll change them at some point. We want to present to our membership, Brandon Hibner, and for you to receive him as a deacon. So all in favor of receiving, if you're a member of of Mercy Village Church, and you're in favor of receiving Brandon Hibner as a deacon of our church, please respond with the word I. 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 And is there, well, we're not done yet. Is there anyone opposed at all? Okay. All right, good. No one opposed? So it is, it is my honor to welcome Brandon Hibner as a deacon of Mercy Village Church. And so, um, may we have our other deacons come up here as well for this. Josh is going to read some, some questions, some promises to you. And at the end of these, if you intend to, to fulfill these noble promises, simply answer, I do. All right, Brandon, do you affirm the doctrinal statement of Mercy Village? Do you affirm the mission, vision, and values of Mercy Village? Do you affirm the membership covenant of Mercy Village? Do you promise by grace alone to pursue ongoing maintenance and growth of the character and qualifications of a deacon laid out in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13? Well, then, Brandon, you are affirmed and received, and now installed as deacon of Mercy Village Church. Please accept these gifts that we have. A Bible and a pair of work gloves. That's what we got to get for our deacons. If if you're willing to submit yourself to a a lifetime of thankless service, you too can get a pair of work gloves. (laughs) Thankless service. Yeah.
<laughs> or you can just buy them yourself at Home Depot. That's a great pitch. Yeah. <laughs> let's, let's pray together. If you, will, if you want to put hands out, like we're laying hands on our deacon here, and we're going to pray for him today. God, thank you for Brandon. Thank you for his family. Thank you uh, that you've called him out uh, uh, of this group of uh, Christians that you've gathered here in the village of Barbersville uh, to serve our church. Thank you uh, for this man and, and his character and his love for his family and his love for Jesus. I just pray that you will bless him with the season of uh, great joy in ministry. That you'll protect him uh, from the evil one. Um, but that, that you'll give him a long-lasting ministry here at Mercy Village Church as you see fit the days that this church will exist and that we will serve you together alongside one another. We thank you for him and his family as they support him in this. Uh, God, we're just thankful for Jesus today and, and what he set in motion, what you set in motion through his life, his death, his resurrection, that we can be a part of the mission here in the village God, we pray that you'll continue to, to save people in our midst and, and call people out that don't know who Jesus is. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Uh, our verses today are from Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 21. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Thank you, Corey, for doing the dirty work for me. Wives, submit to your husbands. Come on. How's that for an introduction, right? It's, an introduction is supposed to get your attention. So, But before you throw anything at me, <laughs> have you seen uh, Princess Bride? Some of you all have seen that, I'm sure. Okay, I know you have because I had to talk like the officiant of the wedding at your wedding, which was beautiful, Robin. Um, If you remember that film, there's this scene where the dread pirate Roberts, his name's Wesley, is trying to chase down Buttercup, his uh, love, and they come to the cliffs of despair, and Andre the Giant straps Vecini, the Sicilian, and the Spaniard I forget his name, Montego, Mondoya, yeah, whatever. And they, he pulls them up on the rope, and then behind them comes up the dread pirate Roberts. And when they get to the top, Vicini, the Sicilian, cuts that rope and it drops, and that's the end, so they think. But then they look over the edge, and, and there's Wesley climbing up the cliff face. And for like the 20th time in the movie, Vicini says his tagline. Does anybody remember what it is? Inconceivable. Inconceivable, he says. And at that point, the Spaniard looks at him and says, you keep using that word, but I do not think it means what you think it means. I will challenge us today that when we come to passages like this, we get hung up sometimes in bad definitions bad experiences, bad interpretations, and we, and rightfully so in some cases, get choked up on what we see or what we think because the Word doesn't mean what we think it means. So hopefully today we can gain some clarity on this issue, both between the relationship of husbands and wives and the relationships of of parents and, and children. And then next week... Pray for me, we go into verses that talk about slaves and masters. So I've got really fun work ahead of me. I'm getting a hate list as we speak. Uh, My email address is paul at bokel.com. That literally is it. Some people think that's a joke, but that really is it, paul at bokel.com. And I would love to have any conversations that might flow out of this. This passage is often ridiculed. But I think if we see it rightly today, we'll see something, something beautiful. A home properly ordered submits itself to Jesus in everything. That's what we'll see today. A home properly ordered submits itself to Jesus in everything. And in doing so, this brings glory to God, fame to the name of Jesus, and joyful flourishing to the household. 
Let's see that together. Father, today what we know not, please teach us. What we are not, please make us. And what we have not, please, please give us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. One point over the next two weeks. How does it look when Jesus orders the home? Only one point, but it's a doozy. There's a lot here to unpack. You see relationships between husbands and wives, relationships between parents and children, and, and next week, relationships between bond servants and masters. And, and there'll be dragons here. The church has created a lot of those dragons, or you know, as a whole, the evangelical church as a whole has created a lot of those dragons that we have to sort through when we come to a passage like this. And so what I want us to do first is see six things. I'm just going to rattle them off, but I think that they help us turn this conversation from bitter to sweet. That's my prayer. That's my hope. The first is really general and broad, but it's true, and, and we see it in the, in the book of Colossae here, or the book of Colossians here, the letter to the saints at Colossae. And that's that God values the home. It is of extreme value to Him. And yet that's done through the observation of the fact that Paul hasn't gotten hyper-practical about anything yet until this point. He's been uh, speaking in big terms about either the cosmic nature of who Jesus is or the communal impacts upon the church that, that are ours through Christ, or even individually, these kind of concepts of compassionate hearts and humility, but he hasn't gotten hyper-specific. Here he does. And the first time he gets hyper-specific is, is when he talks about the, the home. The household is very important to God. How the, the house is ordered, how the home is, is ordered. Two, and I'm gonna, we're going we're gonna to hit these Again, next week, because I want to elaborate on different ones of them. Two is this. Absolute freedom and unrestricted autonomy is a myth. I want to say that. What I mean by that, I'll unpack that just a little bit. I had a big Tim Keller quote I was going to read. I'll read it next week. But he gives examples of like a sailboat. Like what's it look like for a sailboat to be free? For a sailboat to be free, it has to be in the right, you know, place in the water. If the water's too shallow, then in fact, right, like, so the sailboat can't go wherever it wants, is basically the point that he's making. There's no such freedom like that, where a society of people can all just autonomously decide to do whatever they want, say whatever they want, be whoever they want. That type of freedom doesn't exist. You can be free to eat whatever you want, or you can be free to live, to have a healthy life with your grandkids, right? You can't do both. You can't. So the, the reality is that all of us are restricted, whether it's by what God teaches or by just life itself. All of us have restrictions on us. There is no absolute freedom. And we're called as Christians to look at the Word of God and say His way is the best way to find what freedom actually looks like. The best way to freedom. And our faith is challenged all the time in believing that. Because time after time in the scriptures, we see that submission is the way. It's not just a wives thing. It's a body of Christ thing that we are called to be submissive people. When we look in, in the New Testament in particular, there's, there's usage oftentimes of exhort, exhortations of the people of God to voluntarily put themselves under others, to put themselves under the authority or direction of someone, to put themselves under the preferences of someone. All believers are to put themselves under, submit themselves to God. That's in Hebrews and in James. We're called to submit ourselves to the law of the land, unless, of course, it's in violation with the word of God in Romans. The church is called to submit to Christ in Ephesians. Jews and specifically are called to submit to God's righteousness in Romans chapter 10. Humans are called to submit to governing authorities in, in Romans and in Titus and in 1 Peter. Christians are called to submit to their leaders in 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Slaves are called to submit to masters in Titus and 1 Peter. And we'll, we're going to hash that out next week. 
Young men are called to submit to older men in 1 Peter chapter 5. Children to their parents, Luke chapter 2, and again in this passage today. Wives to their husbands in Ephesians, Colossians, Titus, and 1 Peter. And here's the doozy. In Ephesians 5.21, the people of God are called to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This is the message of Scripture, is that we as the people of God are to be submitting to one another. And the best way to understand that is the context of Philippians chapter 2, where Paul says to the church of Philippi, in humility, value others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interest, but each of you to the interest of others. So that is the the big picture idea of what we're called to be as Christians, are people who in humility consider others more valuable than we consider ourselves. That'll test your faith in every single relationship if you seek To live it out. So that's three things already. God values our homes. We have to know that. Absolute, unabridged freedom is not a real thing. And and to to desire that is going to leave you frustrated in so many ways. Submission is the way of Scripture. Fourth, and this matters, the passage we're considering today countless times has been weaponized. For tremendous evils and abuse and pain and control. We have to own that as the people of God, that these verses that we're going to consider over the next two weeks have been weaponized time and time again. These verses have been wielded to undermine and downright destroy human dignity. They've been used for that. But that doesn't mean that that's the intent of these verses. These verses have been used to justify the treatment of image bearers as if they were nothing but property or objects. But that doesn't mean that's the intent of these verses. In less extreme cases, these verses have simply been used to excuse sinful behaviors and manipulation and power grabs and bad behavior in marriage relationships and in parent relationships and in Work relationships. Don't misinterpret these verses, please. Like if you think that these verses are an excuse for you to go home and say, woman, make me a sandwich. Right. You're not you're not reading it properly. And I hope you're comfortable on the couch. Right. Like you're not reading it right. If you think these verses excuse your ability to maybe make your children feel small, then you're not reading them right. You're not interpreting them correctly. If you think these verses excuse the behavior of an employee towards an employer or, or, or anyone who has authority towards, towards those under their authority to, to treat them however they want, you're not, re, you're not interpreting them correctly. Might we not misinterpret them? Instead, might we apply these verses and all the verses of Scripture in the context of all Scripture? What does it mean that a man is the head of the home? I don't know. Maybe I do. But here's what I know. However you understand it has to come in the context of Scripture. And in the immediate context of Scripture, what are all the Christians told to put on? The peace of Christ. What are all the Christians told to to put on? The richness of the Word of God. To put on compassionate hearts and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and forgiveness and love and thankfulness. We just saw that list. You don't get to take those clothes off when you exercise headship in a home. It doesn't it can't be that it can't mean that it can't mean something that would cause you to not be kind. It can't mean something that would cause you to not be humble. It can't mean something that would cause you to not be meek. It can't. 
Not only that, but when you expand to the wider view of Scripture, remember Jesus washing the, like literally the roads, the filthy roads that the disciples would have walked through to the Last Supper, right? That's where all the, the, the animals would have done their business, and then they would have walked through it in their flip-flops to get to the Last Supper. And what's Jesus do when nobody else will do it? He wraps a towel around himself and he washes feet. And then when he's done, he turns to his disciples, and that echoes down to us as well, See what I've done? You should wash each other's feet too. We have to understand these in that call. We're to be people who wash one another's feet. We have to understand it in the context of the first will be last and the last will be first. We have to understand it in the context of the first among you must be servant to all. We have to understand it in the context of, of, of the competition of the kingdom. The apostles say, what's, what's the competition? The one thing we compete in? Outdo one another in showing honor. That's the competition of the kingdom. Like we get in trouble when we try to apply these verses like in a vacuum. We try to like pull them out of the context of Scripture and talk about them in some way that just deflates Or goes against all these other teachings of Scripture. Not to mention we're called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love our neighbor as we love ourselves. On these two commands hang all the law and the prophets, Jesus says. Again, apply all this in the context of Scripture. And then a a sixth thing. and um, There is more in the Bible about the sameness of God's children than there is about their differences. The Bible talks about the differences of, of people, male and female, etc. But it talks way more about the sameness. And that matters. They both matter, but know this today. Think of the creation narrative. What's the first thing that God says? He says, we're going to create humans in the image of God, and then male and female, He creates them in the image of God. The sameness is applied there. And then what's Adam's song when he sees Eve for the first time? He says, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. It's the sameness that he draws attention to. And all throughout Scripture, it's the sameness. I used to take like those passages that say, you will be a son of God or sons of God and just change it to children. Because I thought, oh, that's just really what was meant. And in a sense, that's correct. But you lose a lot of the potency of that, of that when you translate it that way. He meant sons. The apostles meant sons when they wrote that. But what they meant by that was regardless of whether you're male or female, young or old, rich or poor, you're now a son of God because in that day only the sons inherited what belonged to the father. And so he says to them, regardless, of what, even if you're a, a girl or a boy, you're rich or poor, you're young or old, in Christ you're counted as a son. Inherit all that belongs to God. The sameness of the people of God is prolific through Scripture. And so our understanding of the differences must find its context in the sameness. I think it's true, too, that, well, I don't think it's true. I know it's true. All of them would have been there when Tychicus reads this letter to the saints at Colossae. There would have been husbands there and wives there in Philemon's home gathered around as he read the letter. There would have been parents there and children there as he read the letter. And there would have been a slave there named Onesimus who helped bring the letter and a master there named Philemon whose house they were in. And again, we'll we'll talk about that more next week. They were there as this letter was, was read. There's a seventh thing that will come through the passage. We'll see it both weeks. It's actually the most important thing. And that's the call of all Christians to submit ourselves to Christ. All of us must be submitting ourselves to Christ. That's the big takeaway. We can get practical, and we will today, about our relationships, but the biggest takeaway for all of us should be that we are submitting our lives to Jesus. So, with all that said, underlying this conversation, let's look at husbands and wives. Paul doesn't make my job easy because he launches right into it. He says, wives... Submit to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord, verse 18. And then verse 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. 
The first reality that is taught that, that we see here, and it's taught in Scripture, is that there is a teaching that the husband is the head of the home. We see this in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. And with this verse, countless men who are actually still little boys have used those verses to leverage their power and authority and control over a marriage in ways that don't line up with another stinking word in this entire book. That's happened. But yet those words are still there. So those dudes got it wrong. Hear me say that today. They did. If it doesn't line up with all the rest of the teachings of Scripture, they're not getting it right. They're not interpreting it right. Stop doing that. Stop treating your wife as an object to prove your authority in the home. Please, in all love and kindness, grow up. Grow up. It's not how it is. Instead, right, and that, and that happens. We get in trouble when we see the word headship and we attach to it all the ways that the world does headship or leadership. We mess it up as Christians when we do that. We attach to it power. We attach to it control. We attach to it the ability to act however we want and seek our own interest. That is nothing like how the Bible talks about leadership. That's not anything like how the Bible talks about headship. Of course we choke on the verses when we understand them that way. We should choke on the verses if we understand them that way. But that's not what God is saying to us through the Apostle Paul. Hear me today. The the, the Bible defines leadership significantly different. Leaders... Bleed. In that Ephesians passage, he says, Wives, put yourself up under the authority of your husbands. Whoa, that's harsh. We all get choked. But then what's he say to the man? He says, Husbands, die. That's the next verse. Love your wives as Christ loves the church and gave himself up for it. Don't miss that. You're going to get this thing all out of whack. Husbands, die. Die to yourself for the sake of your wife. Come on. I mean, like, honestly, that's, that's there. Leaders bleed in Scripture. Leaders wash feet in Scripture. Leaders lift up others. Leaders have their head on a swivel for how they can cause other people to flourish around them in their lives. That's what leaders do. Leaders surrender their preferences. Leaders get to the back of the line at mealtime and they get to the front of the line at work time. That, like, like, and we could go on and on. I could say you know, whatever other catchy thing, but that's the idea of leadership, of headship in the Bible. Lay your life down. Sam Storms puts it like this, and I, I've linked to the entire article in in our sermon notes on the app he says headship is is more a responsibility than a right men hear that you know, if you if you feel like you're entitled to headship you're not <laughs> headship is more responsibility than a right a right is something we tend to demand and insist upon as something we are owed this can all too often make for an authoritarian and self-serving atmosphere in the home, which is sinful. But when headship is viewed as a sacred trust in which the husband is called by God to lead and honor and sacrifice for his wife, the tone and the mood of the home is radically improved. Headship is the authority to serve. John Stott explains it like this, if headship means power in any sense, then it's the power to care, not to crush, The power to serve, not to dominate. The power to facilitate self-fulfillment, not to frustrate or destroy it. And in all this, the standard of the husband's love 
To be the cross of Christ is to be the cross of Christ on which he surrendered himself even to death in his selfless love for his bride. I, I was talking to Carolyn before this, <laughs> Canini, of how over the years, as I've thought about headship in the home, I used to just want to like put it in this really narrow definition of what it means. But what I've learned in actual marriage and in actual life and in actual counseling of many different marriages is that this is applied very uniquely from relationship to relationship to relationship, not to mention cross-culturally outside of the American way. It's applied very uniquely from house to house and home to home. But what we can't do is treat it like it's not there in the Bible. And what we can't do when we go to apply it in our homes is go in violation of anything else Scripture tells us to do as the people of God. It has to be compassionate. It has to be loving. It has to be feet washing. It has to be sacrificial service. It has to be laying your life down. But in some way, the Bible conveys that there is a responsibility that is laid at the feet of the husband in a marriage. That he is held responsible in a specific way as head of the marriage. So apply that in your marriage with caution. Apply that in your marriage, submitting to the teachings of Scripture in every aspect of your life. Apply that in your marriage, submitting to Jesus and His way. Apply it graciously, gently. And men, apply it with fervency and intentionality that leads you to lay your life down for the sake of your wife. It's in that context, it's in that framework that now the, the wife is called to that submission, to put herself up under, to place herself under, to join herself to God's good design. Clothed in the same things. The compassion, the humility, the washing of each other's feet. And then the husband is commanded again, don't be harsh with your wife. Don't be bitter towards her or give her the re reason to become bitter towards you. Don't be harsh. I'll, I'll say this because I can say it throwing myself under the bus. I've got a, I got a mouth on me. And I've not always wielded my words towards my wife kindly, gently, humbly. Some people would take the way I've spoken to her at times in our past beyond the word harsh. I've made her feel small. I'll be honest with you. I already started talking about it. There are ways that my wife and I still interact with each other that are tainted by the harshness, the attitudes, the gruffness, the aggressiveness that I brought into our marriage early on. Might we be better men than that? Get a hold of your mouth, please. I'm trying. Try with me. We build our wives up, not tear them down. Children, thank God we can move on to the children. <laughs> Verse 20 and 21 of Colossians. And they're not in here to be mad at me. Children, obey your parents in everything. Get that printed out and put it in every room of the house. Children, obey your parents in everything for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. First, know this today, and we have to embrace this in our culture, in every culture. Your child's obedience to you is a good thing. 
It is. I think sometimes we try to excuse ourselves away from it. We, may, we, we try to think that expectations of obedience on our children are confining them or constricting them, but, but it's a good thing to expect our children to be obedient. It pleases God the Father for your children to be obedient. And God the Father is pleased with the things that cause uh, creation and His saints to flourish. And so the obedience of your children towards you can be for their flourishing. We must hold our children accountable. It is a good gift to give to our children to hold them accountable. It's a kind thing. So have reasonable, gentle, consistent, and steady expectation of obedience from your children. Expect that from them. Obedience is a gift from God. It's for God's pleasure. It's for their joy. So holding them accountable is a good thing. We have to hold on to that reality. But second, don't be a jerk. That's what Paul would have said in our language today. Don't be a jerk to your kids. Don't provoke them. Don't be short with them. I've done that. Don't be sarcastic in a mean way with them. I've done that. Don't scream. I've done that. The the, the fact that CPS wasn't called on our home when I first became a father is shocking. I've made all the mistakes. I've done that. Don't throw things. I took a cookie box one time. I, it was a box like the cookies from Kroger. See, this is like honest confessions with your pastor today. I got so mad at my children. I was holding the cookie box. It had like three cookies left in it. You know, they're lined up real nice or whatever. I got so mad, I don't remember which one, I said something that made him feel so small, and I took that cookie box and I threw it over the back of my head because that's, I mean, intense, how intense my anger was. It slams against the microwave, spins over, falls down on the stove, and all the cookies remained in exactly the perfect place that they were in before. And that made me even more mad. It doesn't work. It doesn't. Don't be mean to your kids. Don't make them feel small. But can I preach to us directly and gently today? Sometimes we fall into the second one because we haven't done the first one. We're not holding our children accountable to obedience until they've annoyed the stinking snot out of us and we lose it. Right? Because we haven't been consistent with them. Now all of a sudden we're like, man, I don't even like these kids. And we lose it. Again, might we be the first, seeing it as a good gift to hold our children accountable, might we be consistent and gentle and loving in that so that we're not as tempted to break out in harshness? Because the inconsistency of expectations and the inconsistency of our emotions, as Paul says, will discourage our children. The, the, the most inconsistent emotions until... I won't say that. I can't say that about my children. I was going to tell you who's the most emotionally unstable now. How dirty would that be? See, for me to do that. It's been me for years. It has. And that discourages my children. Frustrates my children. So as we exercise discipline and accountability and correction with our children, don't burden your children with unhealthy rules. Don't burden your children with unhealthy expectations. Don't burden your children with inconsistency, but instead give them needed, helpful, and biblical rules and expectations that are clearly stated and reasonably uh, applied and, and held accountable for. Again, there's uniqueness to each relationship, each family in this. But consistently, firmly, patiently, gently might we hold our children accountable. So methods of discipline are another conversation I don't want to have this morning. I I can talk privately with anyone if you care what I think about that. But I will say this. As we strive to discipline our children, here's a couple of things we should be thinking through. Discipline of our children should be a teaching and growth opportunity. That should be our mindset when we discipline our children. This is a teaching and growth opportunity. Build them up. Don't break them down. Build them up. Don't 
break them down. Number two, this uh, discipline should be a reminder that you love them and desire their good. Right? Like in the ways I've disciplined my children sometimes in the past, and, and I want you all to be honest too. Like don't leave me being the only one being honest today. But in the ways I've disciplined my children in the past, I haven't left them feeling loved. I've left them instead questioning whether or not, whether or not I love them. Might we realize that love is more powerful than shame as we discipline our, our children. Three, and this matters too, discipline, however, in our kindness and in our love and in our clarity, it still should cost our children something. Again, I'm not telling you specifically how to discipline your children, but it should cost them something. To pretend like disobedience doesn't cost something is not fair to your children. You're not painting a real picture of, of reality to them. And not a biblical picture either. Disobedience costs something. And so in your uh, holding them accountable for the rules uh, and standards of your home, it needs to, to cost them something. This can be unique to each child, by the way. There's certain ways that you might execute something costly to one child that won't even phase the other. So be, be aware of that. Number four, be consistently and fairly applied as best as we can. Discipline should be consistently and fairly applied. The slow and steady wins the race. The tortoise always wins. Right? Have you ever found yourself in that moment where your kid's doing something because you've kind of just not been applied to anything and you say something outrageous like, if you do that again, you won't touch a video game controller for the next six months. And then as soon as it comes out of your mouth, you're like, but how am I going to get any peace and quiet for the next six months, right? Like, and you just made some grand gesture. You just kind of painted yourself into the corner, right? Like you just... Slow and steady wins the race. You're not going to get it right every day as a parent. You're not going to get it right every moment as a parent. Might we be slow and steady? They don't need grand gestures from us. They need us to grow in consistency and clarity. And then lastly, and this matters, I think, as much as any of them, we should strive to model ownership of our own sin and repentance before our children. You want them to learn how to do those things? You do it. Early and often, be repenting in front of your children and to your children and owning your sin and your shortcomings in front of them. Man, there we go. I'm convicted. I've been convicted all week. As a husband, we went to King's Island yesterday. I get motion sickness, so I can't ride any rides. I hate spending money, and I really hate spending, overspending for food. It's hot, not as hot as it will be later this year, but it's hot. And I'm hurting four kids and then one of my kids' friends around King's Island. You think I got this right yesterday? No, I didn't. But I'm not going to stop trying. I'm not. Those of you that have been given the blessing of children, it is a worthy calling to keep striving again and again And again, and again, and again. To be the parent who's clothed in humility and meekness and compassion. Who holds them accountable in ways that are loving and gentle, but yet clear and consistent. It's worthwhile calling. Don't quit after the King's Island trip. Keep going. Striving, because in it all, the direct the direction is beyond just parents and right. Like, it's the other thing I always think. I'm like, well, what about the 
What about the barren who are in our presence? Like, how do they apply this to their lives? What about the single people? How do they apply this to their lives? Here's the application for everyone, for all of us. It's, it's found in next week's passage. This is a sneak peek. Verses 23 and 24. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So while the direct application today would be a home rightly ordered is one that submits to Jesus and everything, the general application for everyone here would be a life rightly ordered is a life that submits to Jesus in everything. Whether you're married or not, whether you have kids or don't, whether you're a grandparent, whether you're a child, all of it, submit your life to Christ. Paul gets specific about these things. I don't know why. That's another conversation I had this morning. Like these were the things he chose to, to directly apply. There's a thousand behaviors he could have addressed. These are the ones he chose to. But the overarching theme today is not wives and husbands and parents and children. The overarching theme today and the thing that will spill down into all your relationships is if you submit your life to Christ. And speaking of which, if, if you're not a Christian, Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, if you submit yourself to His authority and His lordship and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. If you're not a Christian, submit your life today to the risen Jesus by grace through faith. Right? Like What can get lost in a real practical sermon like this is that very explicit gospel message that makes all of it make sense. Jesus laid down His life for the church. Those of us, all of us, were guilty of sin. Sin separates us from long-term familial relationship with God. Jesus took our sin and carried it to the cross. He died in your place and mine. He spilled out His blood and the blood of Jesus Christ. God's Son cleanses us from all sin, all unrighteousness. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. Because He didn't stay dead. He was raised from the dead. Believe that you'll be saved. Submit yourself to the Lordship of Jesus. In that way, you'll be, you'll be saved. I'd love to talk to you about that if you have any, any questions. Christians, submit your life to Jesus afresh and again and again and again. Just because you're already a Christian doesn't mean that you don't still need all the grace and all the faith that God can give you. You need every last bit of it. Submit your life to Him again and again. One homework assignment this week would be to pray, God, give me faith to believe your ways are best. God, give me faith to believe your ways are best and then to walk in your ways. In everything. Right? Like that's the beauty of the Holy Spirit being present with us today is He can apply that to your life very directly where I can't. I don't know all the little details that you need to apply that to, but the Holy Spirit does. Submit your life to Jesus. And if applicable, submit your marriage and submit your family to Jesus afresh today and again and again and again. Pray, God, give me the faith to believe that your ways of being a husband are the best ways. Give me faith to believe that your ways of being a wife are the best ways. Give me faith to believe that your ways of being a parent are the best ways and help me to submit myself to walking in those, those ways. And then lastly, if necessary, own your sin and shortcomings with God, with your spouse, and with your family. Maybe... It's not maybe for me. i got to go home and repent to my middle son in particular for the way I spoke to him at Kings Island yesterday. I got to preach the sermon without applying it, by the way. That's grace for all of us here. I'm going to go apply it this afternoon because God got a hold of me here. I pray that he got a hold of you here too. Maybe there's some repentance that needs to happen towards your wife or towards your husband, towards your children, towards God.
I can't promise you how your spouse will respond, and I can't promise you how your kids will respond, but I can promise you how, how God will respond. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Bring your knuckleheaded parental moments to Jesus and He will not laugh at you or cast you out or shame you or scold you. He will say, you are forgiven and free. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's not just the forgiveness for today, but it's the rest of yoking up with Him and going forward as a parent in the future. Bring your knuckleheaded moments as a husband or a wife to Jesus today. Bring your knuckleheaded uh, moments just as a Christian to Jesus today, and He will not cast you out. For Him to be faithful and for Him to be just, He put Himself on the hook. He has to forgive you. Do you get that? He doesn't have the choice because He already made the choice. Thousands of years ago, he made the choice. In eternity past, he made the choice. He will forgive you. Repent to God, repent to your spouse, repent to your family as as needed. A home properly ordered submits itself to Jesus and everything, and in doing so, brings glory to God, fame to Jesus, and joyful flourishing to, to the household. Father, thank you so much for your love, your compassion, your care. Thank you that everything you ask us to clothe ourselves in has been purchased for us by the blood of Jesus. And so as husbands and wives in this room, might we clothe ourselves in the wardrobe that we talked about in the three weeks previous to this, the, the, the wardrobe that has been purchased for us by the blood of Christ. Might we be people who wash one another's feet. May we be husbands and wives who wash one another's feet, who lay our lives down, who are servants to one another, who desire each other's flourishing and good. Might we be those types of husbands and wives? Might we be those types of parents and children? Might we be those types of Christians in all of our relationships, submitting ourselves to your son Jesus by saying, you've given me compassion, I'll put it on. You've given me humility, I'll put it on. You've given me meekness, I'll put it on. And these will be the clothes I wear into all of my relationships, in particular those in my household. Make us those types of people by your grace. It's the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. We're only going to take 60 seconds because I'm long-winded and I apologize. We're going to take 60 seconds of silence. What I would challenge you to do is at least read those questions that are on the screen or at least read those questions that are on the back of your half sheet of paper and commit yourself to thinking through them this week as the music plays and then we'll celebrate communion. Can I have, uh, are all three of our deacons in here? Can I have you all come forward to serve uh, communion? Brandon, you're the newest, so you can, you get the gluten-free tray. I mean, (laughs) the best part about this is if it's not gluten-free, you get blamed for having distributed it to people. We will uh, collect the elements, return to our seats, and then we'll read a passage together and we'll all partake of the elements together. Again, Brandon has the gluten-free elements. Thank you. I want to remind us in this moment that we don't do, especially if you're brought up in a church that maybe does something like what a lot of people call an altar call, but the pastors are available for conversation, for questions. If you've been injured by the misapplication of these scriptures and you got wounds that you want to talk through, we're available. If you got stuff that you want to pray about that maybe is application of these scriptures, we're available. If you have other things that are not related to anything we talked about today that you want to talk, we're available. And the beauty of that, I hope that you can lay hold of, is that I mean that with all of my heart. I cannot overemphasize the fact that when this crowd is dismissed, I'm going to be standing here. If you don't know what it means to be a Christian and you want to talk about it, I'd love to have that conversation. We are available. Pastor Josh is with the kids, but once he's free from the kids, he'll, he's available. We'd love to talk to you about anything that has to do with your walk with Christ or becoming a follower of, of Jesus.
Mark chapter 14, verses 22 through 25. As they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it, and he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. Receive this benediction from Numbers chapter 6 verses 24 through 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. You're dismissed.